Okay, good morning, everybody. We are stay, uh, starting uh, CMSA colloquium. Today, we are very pleased to introduce Jose Scheinkman. Uh, he, he is one of the best living mathematical economists. Um, uh, he's, um, he works mostly on finance, macroeconomics, and monetary economics, but he has done a lot of work in many different areas. Before his PhD in economics, uh, Jose actually got a master's degree in mathematics. And he sp has spent most of his career at the University of Chicago, where he was the chairman of the de economics department. Uh, Jose is also well known for uh, advising many outstanding students who became stars uh, themselves eventually. He's also one of the few uh, economists who do not shy away from uh, interacting with the real world. So in Jose's case, he advised uh, many uh, big companies uh, like Goldman Sachs or a fin fin financial technology pioneer Stone Co. from Brazil. He has also contributed uh, to Brazilian uh, social policy uh, discussion and, and make policy making. So without further ado, Jose, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Sergey, for this invitation. I'm really sorry last spring, you know, we couldn't, I couldn't make it to Harvard by the time, uh, by the time the seminar was scheduled, uh, we all got, you know, uh, travel became very difficult. So I'm very, it's a great pleasure to talk here. And by the way, after this, if anybody wants to send me emails with ideas and so on, because I have a lot of questions, mathematical nature, which would be very, that I'll pose them as we go, okay? So, um, the first thing, I'm gonna give you a fast plan for the lecture. I'm actually gonna talk about a specific example, but I think of this example as illustrating an approach to problems in economic dynamics. It's my first attempt, and this is the first paper I write with these ideas, so, <clears throat> But similar ideas, I think, must have appeared in other fields, perhaps not in economics. Um, so the way we're gonna do is that, I'm gonna start looking at a model, a typical economic model with a continuum of competing small agents that face an exogenous forcing process. In this case, the forcing process is gonna be inflation. <clears throat> and then they take as exogenous, this agent takes as exogenous, the value of equilibrating variables and solve an optimal control problem. Now the solution of this agent's control problem is, is gonna generate values for the equilibrating values, variables, and a stationary team will require that the agents take these values as given, the same values are generated. In that sense, economists talk about an equilibrium. Now, what's gonna be different in this case is that I'm gonna think of a world in which I only have a large number of agents, no, no longer continuum, <clears throat> but the agents are going to be using the decision rules, sometimes we call economists call this policy functions, uh, of the continuum model. And I will study what happens in the quick model. I'm going to talk about theoretical results, but I'm going to end up mentioning some data. So <clears throat> here's the example I'm going to work with. I'm not going to spend <clears throat> too much time discussing the, the example, the economics of the example, but I want to give you the flavor. So macroeconomists often assume manual costs. They need a real resources to change nominal prices. And that has a role of both explaining what we call price stickiness, why prices don't move as much as, don't move so smoothly as we think they should, but also the vice to produce relationship between level of inflation and output loss. Now, the theoretical models in this, in this whole approach typically use mean field models, that is, models that continue of agents. I'll talk about that in a moment. And they're capable to generating several observables which are important and, and seem to fit such uh, data. But I'm interested here what happens when n is large but, fi but finite. And I'm gonna to try to think about the implication of distributions for the frequency, mostly for the frequency, but also the size of price changes. And I'm gonna to try to explain the observed correlation between level and volatility or aggregate inflation. That's gonna be at the end. So let's talk about fluctuations. So often economists assume that individual firms are small, so are individual consumers. Formerly we do continuum models. And 
you know, as you'd expect, shock should average out. Now, to explain the fact that we observe a lot of aggregate fluctuations in the economy, we postulate aggregate shocks. Maybe they're aggregate shocks because they're aggregate shocks to monetary policy or because they're aggregate shocks to productivity, etc. Now, there's another approach which is, has been pursued mostly by uh, Harvard economist named Xavier Gabex to look at granular firms, looking at some firms which are so big that even though they have their own idiosyncratic shocks, they affect the whole economy. Now, in today's lecture, I'm going to think about a large but finite number of firms and no aggregate shocks. So the fluctuations are going to result from self-organization that is a characteristic of the equilibrium that arises from the dynamics. This is a theme that I pursued, you know, probably before some of you guys were born in a paper with a physicist, Per Bach, and, um, and another economist, Mike Woodford, that was then my colleague at Chicago and today is my colleague at Columbia, and also by Makoto Nire, who is a student at the University of Chicago in his thesis and, and further papers. So, uh, so I'm gonna talk about the implication for the distribution of frequency and size of price changes, etc. I already mentioned that. Now, how this talk is gonna work is gonna be, I'm gonna write down a model of manual cost with a continuum of optimizing firms. Economists have been doing this for a long time. Now mathematicians have become interested in this general class of problems. And in mathematics it's called usually a mean field game. Uh, starting with the work of Jean-Michel Latsky and Pierre-Louis Lyons. Um, and so just that it just situates that. But this, the way I'm approaching is basically the way economists have approached this particular set of problems for a while. Now, in this mean field game, I'm going to think about the following question. Suppose a positive set of measures, a positive measure set of firms changes prices. And then they're going to induce Another set, of, uh, another set of firms to reprice of measure M prime. And I'm look, going to look at this derivative as a measure of complementary repricing. It's going to become more clear when I write the math. So in this continuum firms model, this, this measure of complementarity is related to the constant rate of repricing and there'll be no volatility, there'll be no avalanches. However, for finite, but large N, I'm going to study distribution of price changes, okay? Assume agents use the decision rules of the continuum model, because to solve for the optimal decision rules for the finite or large N is a problem of very high dimensionality, safe impossible to solve in any interesting way. So we're trying to reduce the dimensionality of the state vector. Now I'm going to show that the complementarity and price changes from the continuum is going to create repricing avalanches. Then I'm going to show that this produces precise results on the distribution of the number of firms that change prices. I'm going to have a precise analytical form for the distribution. And I'm going to put a lower bound to what is called sometimes the coefficient of dispersion. And here you have to take a little bit of care because there are several things that statisticians call coefficient of dispersion. And think about the variance divided by the mean. Uh, on the distribution of the size of avalanches as n goes to infinity. That lower bound is going to be 1 or 1 minus theta squared. And of course, and I'm going to show that theta goes to 1 as pi goes to infinity. So the ratio of variance to mean is going to explode as, as the inflation rate becomes high. More importantly, I'm going to show in a couple of examples that if you calibrate that to actual data, you get data which are pretty close to one, even though average inflation in this data are fairly small. They're doing at 3% in one case and 8% in the other. Okay. So in particular, I'm going to use US data from the US economy, but also data from the Billion Price Project, which is a project that has been uh, uh, done by, by some economists at Harvard and MIT of collecting prices in the internet. So you get very high frequency data, and I'm going to talk about that. And this is joint work with two students, Laura Leal at Princeton and Harry McKean at Columbia, the one with the Billion Price Project. Okay, now I'm going to present you the, econ now I'm going to start with some substance, and uh, I'm going to first present you
just how the model works for continuous firms. Okay. Um, so the way it works is like this. You have a consumption good that's, co that's produced by competitive industry. When economists talk about a competitive industry, what they basically means is one where profits are driven to zero, okay? Using a continuum of intermediate goods. And this form of Y, which is there, is the production function in the competitive industry. Uh, it's not very important at this point. We're not gonna use anything specific about this form. Um, whatever is used, I'm going to mention specifically. Now, every good I is produced by a single firm. And that gives that single firm a certain amount of monopoly power, even though you know, they have to be combined with all the other goods, so the monopoly power is limited, but it's produced by a single firm which has labor at a given wage rate W. Okay, the output of the firm is just proportional to the amount of workers they, they hire. So YI is equal to LI, LI is the amount of labor they hire. Now what the firm can do at any point in time, you choose a price they're gonna charge and then they must satisfy demand, okay? So at point time, they're, they're like a monopolist in the sense they can choose the price. Of course, the demand is, they don't have so much elastic demand necessarily, so it means that they don't have, when they choose, if they choose, if they choose a very high price, they get a very low demand, that's okay. But that's the price, the good eye. There's also the price of the consumption good, which is the final good. Now, everything is gonna be, uh, geared towards simplifying the system. So the first thing we're going to observe is that we're going to, it's easy to, to, to derive from the, from the demand function that comes from the competitive sector, that the supply that every firm I is going to have to satisfy, because they have to satisfy the demand, that what they will have to supply is going to be proportional to the price, which is power minus zeta, times the aggregate uh, production in the competitive industry at time t, which is yt. Okay. This pi is the relative price that they are charging relative to the price of the competitive of the final good. Okay, so that's the first thing we have to know. And then you can compute what the profit will be. Okay, uh, it's again. It's, it depends on the wage rate they have to pay because they have to hire, hire labor, and you get a formula for it. Nothing of that is important. And we're going to define inflation as the rate of change of the price of the final good. So consumers are buying the final good, so that's what determines inflation. Now notice the following. If a firm were to keep constant their nominal price, capital P, the real price is going to decline at rate pi. That's the equation that's written there. Now we're going to introduce, as I said, a cost of price change, the menu cost. So the menu cost, we're gonna give the model to be very simple. So we're gonna make it proportional to the level of production of, 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 production of the final good, Y. So it's gonna be a number delta times Y. Okay, now the nominal menu cost, which is the Calvo event, which we're gonna call a Calvo event, arrives at the Poisson rate mu. What does that mean? Sometimes a firm, and a firm I, will get a chance to change the price without paying, without paying this, this cost delta y, okay? That's the only source of exogenous uncertainty is gonna be independent across firms, okay? So because it's independent across firms, there's no aggregate shocks in this economy. The only source of exogenous uncertainty is that firms get this chance, this Poisson process, when this Poisson process rings, they can change their prices, okay? Now, we're also gonna have a representative household. So the households are gonna be all identical, okay? They all gonna maximize some kind of discounted expected utility, and their utility is gonna depend on the one hand, the term U depends on C, which is consumption, but also on N, the amount they're working. Of course, more C is more utility, less N is more utility. People usually have this utility for work, according to economists. Although we academics don't seem to demonstrate that, we work all the time. And then they all have, um, they also have utility for the money. It's, in the sense, this is a shortcut that economists um, adopt to say, look, you know, people demand money. And the way they demand money, they have utility for the real balances they are holding, 
which is the value of, of, of nominal balance as MT divided by the price level PT. They take as given the wage rate, but they have a constraint, okay? And constraint two is gonna be the important thing for us. It's gonna say, look, at every period in time, let's look at the right-hand side. They start with, they sell their labor at NT amount. They get a real wage rate of W. I'm doing everything in nominal terms, so I'm gonna multiply by the price of the final good. That's the first portion. The second portion, they're gonna receive dividends from the profits of the firms. That's the second process DT, which is the cumulative total nominal net profits of the intermediary good producers. They're gonna receive, presumably, they may receive a transfer from the government, and that's the process DT, which is money, which is you know, given to them. And then in the end, they have to, to spend, pay their consumption. And whatever is left over is their accumulation of money. Okay, now I'm going to talk about what we mean by stationary equilibrium. In the stationary equilibrium, first of all, we're going to have, we're going to think of a constant inflation pi, which is going to be positive. Okay, at this point, pi is going to be positive. Okay, and uh, we're going to think as the government, you know, you guys, I don't know how much you guys have heard about helicopter money. It's just a modeling device, although Ben Bernard got seriously of using it. Uh, during the 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 the, the uh, crisis that that came after two thousand and eight, so the money they are going to be transfer money, which is proportional to the amount of transfers done previously, times pi, so that the amount of money is growing at a rate pi too. Okay, now we have to solve for a bunch of things. First is that what's going to be the stationary distribution of firms relative prices. I'm going to call capital F. What's going to be the level of final good output? I'm going to call Y bar. What's going to be the level of consumption, which I'm going to call C bar? What's going to level the level of money that real money that individuals are going to hold? I'm going to call M bar. What's the level of the wage rate, constant level of wage rate? I'll call W bar. And then there's going to be a constant rate of firms, lambda, that's going to pay this menu cost. That all happens in stationary. And I wrote here all the equations. I'm not going to read the math, but just tell what the equation. The first equation says, you know, prices have to grow at this rate pi. That's what stationarity with constant inflation means. The second, because the industry, final goods industry is competitive, okay, the average price to the power charged by the different firms to the price one minus eight is gonna be have equal to one where the average is taking the, the distribution F. You're also going to have the labor demand is going to be equal to the labor supply. On the left hand side, I wrote the labor demand is across the different firms average out. N bar is gonna be the labor supply that is gonna be given by the typical household. The next equation says the consumption has to be equal to total output times one minus delta times lambda. Why? Because delta is what's the real goods that are paid in menu costs every time a firm adjusts their costs, adjusts their prices, and lambda is the rate at which firms are, are paying the, the are, are deciding to pay these menu costs. Okay. Then there is a, there is a, Two other equations for the consumers, the wage rate has to satisfy the relationship between marginal utility of income and marginal utility of consumption, and also they have to be satisfied the amount of money they're holding. Now, this is what, you know, sorry. This is what, uh, it's called the mean field gain. The strategic agents here, which are the firms, only care about the aggregate variables and their own prices. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the, the decision problem of the firms. The decision problem of the firms works the following way. First of all, they take the wage rate as given, they take the aggregate level consumption as given, and then they're going to solve a control problem. What does the control problem um, uh, amounts to? It amounts to choosing times at which you're gonna change your price, okay? And um, also, 
the price at which you're going to put your price at. Now, the first thing you're going to think is the following. Look, you, have, you, can, you can reason immediately by saying the following. If a firm chooses to, to move prices or gets a chance of moving prices at zero cost, it's always going to choose the same price. Why? Because it's going to be the one that is going to give them the highest possible value from then on. Okay. So the way you solve this, you, you write down this, this decision problem, you have a value, you, you think about the value function. And everything is rigged in this model so that the value function of the firm, remember, it depends on the price that they are charging now. It depends on the, the it depends on the W, which is the wage rate, but which they take as given, and depend on the Y, which they also take as given. Everything in the model is written so that that function can be written in a linear form with respect to Y. And we can concentrate on the portion of the value function, dependence of the value function with respect to P, essentially, because W is taken. But W is an index, so I put it here. And the equation in this page tells what the value function has to satisfy. If I'm sitting now today at a price P, the value, the optimal value that I can achieve is the supreme over all the stopping times and price I can move to, okay, of the expected value as of today of the following, the following expression. On the, first, on the first hand, until either I arrive at the stopping time T prime or I, the cover shocker allows me to change it as, at, 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 no, at no cost, I'm going to enjoy the discounted profits of, that I'm going to enjoy through the trajectory of P of T that would happen once I don't change my prices. That's the integral term. And then you have to think about what happens when I move. Now, I can move for two reasons. I can move either because I reach a stopping time where I decide to pay the menu cost, or I get lucky, I get a cover shock. So you take the minimum between these two stopping times, you discount at the rate growth that the firm is discounting everything, okay? And now you take, you're gonna get the VW, the value from that P prime on, and, but however, you're gonna pay delta if your stopping time arrives before the cover stopping time. That's, so that's the formula. So solving those problems are fairly standard problem. Of course, use the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation and the stationary solution to the forward equation because I'm looking for a stationary equilibrium. Now, at the bottom of this page, I wrote the, the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. It has the form of some kind of quasi-variational inequality. Okay, it has two, two terms, okay? The first term involves what happens if the firm doesn't do anything at that instant. At that instant, they don't stop the process. They don't stop the process. They're going to enjoy in the next instant the profits, right? However, they're going, because they discount, they're going to lose the value from the discounting. They value less tomorrow than today. But they're also going to lose from the fact that inflation is eating their price. Right, so their, their, their price, their real price is going down at a rate which is pi times the, price, the real, real price today times the margin and that, that causes a, a loss of the value function which is proportional to the derivative with respect to price. But they may get lucky. They may get lucky because they may get a cover shock. The cover shock happens at a rate mu and if the cover shock happens, they're gonna to move to the price P prime, which is the best price they can charge, but they're going to lose today's value. Okay, so that's what they're going to get. That's their expected uh, profit for the next instant. But they have to, they have to, 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 to balance that. They can also do. They have also another another possibility. They can stop the process immediately. They can say, "Look, I'm changing my prices now." They change my prices now. They get the best they can do the supreme of your W P prime, but they also lose the delta that they have to pay and they lose the, whatever they're enjoying now. So this kind of solving, we have to solve this kind of quasi-variational inequality, but that's a fairly standard thing. You know, you guess that the value function in the continuation region is where the first term 
assumes is zero and the other one is less than or equal to zero, uh, then we satisfy this equation with some appropriate boundary conditions. I'm not going to discuss them here. It's not important for us now. And then we're going to show that for every pi and w, you can solve uniquely this equation um, nine here, okay, plus the boundary conditions. Then you're going to use a verification theorem uh, to verify that this, you actually found your value function, and then you're going to talk about the optimal policy. When you do all that, you get a picture like the one I, I draw here. The picture is the value function as a function of p. This value function of, as a function of p has uh, essentially three regions. If p is very low, you better stop immediately. So then you're going to go to p star, which is the maximum value, but you're going to lose delta. If P is also very high, you better stop immediately. In the meantime, what happens? If your price happens to be high, but not too high, you're going to drift towards P star. Okay? Once you get to P star, you're going to continue to drift down to P bar, P lower bar. But if you think about the stationary distribution, the support is all in P lower bar P star. So that's where all the action is going to happen, this region P lower bar P star, where you have where you have uh, the value function, and that's your optimal policy, okay? All right, now, you can compute the density, it's not very hard, some kind of power function for the stationary distribution. Uh, you can also compute the rate of, at which you get firms hitting the lower boundary, P lower bar, that we call lambda. When they reach P lower bar, they pay the manual cost and go back to P star. So that's what the operable policy is. If you low, reach below a bar, just pay the menu cost and go back to P star. So um, there's only pro positive price change in stationary equilibrium. That's, that's just a mathematical fact. And so the productivity shock, um, are, we introduce sometimes productivity shocks to deal with negative price changes, but I won't do this today. And then you get a proposition so that if this menu cost delta are not too high, you can find a unique wage rate that depends, of course, on pi, and that's the whole thing yields a stationary equilibrium once you fix the wage rate. Okay. Now, I want to talk about what's going to, what I mean by the measure complementary. And to do that, I'm going to change a little bit my, my variables. Instead of looking at the variable p, I'm going to look at this variable s for each firm i. What I'm going to do. I'm going to look at how distance the firm is from the lower bound, P lower bar, relative to how far that firm could ever be. Because we know that the whole dynamics happens in P lower bar, P star. So I'm just going to have a measure of the distance that the firm is now between P lower bar and P star. I normalize that, that this that thing to be 0, 1. So that's this formula for S. That's, that's, of course, it's a smooth transformation of the prices. Prices have a density. It's going to have a stationary distribution, a little g. Now, the first thing I want to ask is that what happens if a very tiny number of firms around that right now in position, around position S, what happens when those firms receive simultaneously a cover shock? I know that's mathematically impossible, but I want to take the limit as this number of firms goes to zero. And we're going to compute the measure of firms that we price as a result of that. Because when the small number of measure of firms that are around position S change their prices for whatever reason, in this point, because they receive a cover shock, they can change for free, they will change. That will change the price level. The price, all prices on average go up because some firms don't change and others go up. You get a bump in the price level. If I'm a firm, my relative price now may become too small, and I may decide now to change. And so the, 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 the limit of this number of firms that I started with goes to zero, give you a number that I'm going to call theta naught of s. Okay, so theta naught of s is like the, you can think of it as rate at which firms would change prices as a result of firm in s, in little s we're seeing a cover shock. I'm going to be particularly interested in theta naught of zero, which is what happened with a, cover, with a firm which is at position zero. Remember, position zero is P lower bar. 
right? Because S equal to zero corresponds to P lower bar. So the firm would change in any case. But let's suppose that that firm changes either because it had a call for shop or because it decides to pay the menu cost. Um, that firm changes. And I'm going to ask how many other firms are going to change. Now, what's the density of firms that change? You can prove that theta is less than one. You can prove that lambda, that rate at which firms are going to pay um, menu costs is proportional to one over one minus theta. So it's going to become very large as theta converges to one. And again, as theta goes to one, as pi goes to infinity, and also for parameters estimated from the US economy, theta is close to one. Okay, now I've done that. Now I'm going to think about the model with a, with a large head. And I'm not going to write, I mean, I have the equations written on the, on the, on the board, but what I'm doing is basically the form. I'm trying to use the riemann stilts approximation to an integral, okay? So I'm going to make all firms of size one over n. I'm going to make all productions, mean sums, and everything works out, okay? I don't have to explain to you guys, you guys know this better than me. So you also have a condition for zero profit in the final goods industry. Everything works the same way. And the menu costs, of course, have to be proportional for each firm, proportional to y divided by n. So in the end, you get the right limits. But everything is the same. Now, here comes our behavioral assumptions, which are the most important, uh, I think, part of, of, of the paper, in a sense. It makes everything go. I'm going to assume that to reduce the number of state variables, I'm going to assume that Everyone in this world, in this mini world that I design here, behaves as if they live in the continuum of producers model. Okay, they ignore the fact there's only like 30,000 firms, or like in the US data, there are 80, truly there are 80,000 firms that are used for the CPI. We're going to ignore that, okay? We are 80,000 different goods. They may not be produced by different firms, by the way. 30,000 firms in our example, for instance, you see, or 7,000 firms in another example. Um, and they're going to think, I live in this continuum world. I've written everything here, what that means, but that's what you have to get in your mind. You live in this continuum world. Now, what's going to happen for a firm for in, this, in this finite world? Now, if I am a firm that is right now charging more than P lower bar, remember, I'm using the continuum rule. So I look and say, I'm above P lower bar, I should do nothing. If I have no cover shock, I don't change my price, okay? And nothing else happens. Now, so repricing requires a shock. Some firm has to be shocked, otherwise nothing happens here. They stay put, everybody stays put. But that says repricing as a compound Poisson process because the shocks are Poisson. So if the shocks are Poisson, it's going to be a compound Poisson process, okay? Now, if a shock occurs, I'm going to be in interested in the distribution of the number of price changes. But this system exhibits what I call complement, what we call complementarity. If I know the prices that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm charging today, I'm from L, and I'm charging a price P T minus, you know, just, the limit just before I arrive at T, I'm choosing, I, I am uh, uh, the limit coming from the right on time, right? Um, uh, I'm charging price P out T minus. Now, the more firms we price now at instant T, the more I'm likely to reprice, right? Because there are more prices going up, the rel my, my relative price is going to go down by more. And, I'm and you can show that the theta, remember the continuum model, is an approximation, good approximation of the order of big O to the N inverse for the mean number of firms that are induced to reprice when a firm reprices at P lower bar. So now I want to describe what's going to, how we're going to do price adjustment with a little picture. So in practice, how are we going to think about this problem? First of all, we're going to start, remember we're in a stationary distribution, so I'm going to draw N firms from the stationary, from n copies of the stationary distribution. Okay, now independently. Now I'm going to assume the cover shock happens to firm SN just to, just to keep account. It doesn't matter which one. One of them gets a cover shock. 
Now, all the firms, you can compute this, that for every firm with L less than N, except for the nth firm that had a cover sharp single to P star, their S is going to decrease by this number epsilon naught that I computed here. Okay, so that's what happened with that. Now, the next question is that some of those firms are going to end up, because they start very close to zero, they're going to end up with an S after the adjustment. They're going to, they would end up with an S negative. And that's this firm number one in this, in this, in this graph. Use. That's the only one that would, because all of them are going to go to the left by epsilon naught. They're below epsilon naught. They're going to become negative. So they reprice. If we price it at instant, okay? Now, now I'm gonna call M naught the number of firms that we price it. This picture is one, but that's okay, right? Now, I have, I can compute what happens to the price of all the other firms, given that M naught firms we price. And I can, that one, I, that number would tend to be bigger. Why? Because the firm that we price had prices closer, had S is closer to zero, this price is clo closer to P lower bar, and they go all the way up to P star. So you can compute those numbers, okay? And then you ask the same question again. Well, now if this firm move, other firms now are gonna become negative, like the second little ball that I have there. That's another firm that became negative, not because the first firm moved, because they're above epsilon naught, but because now, one firm had a cover shock and now the first firm moved and that's it, okay? So that's, that gives you M1. Now one thing you can prove with the expected value of M1 is theta M0, okay? And when does this process stop? It stops when you reach MJ equal to zero. The moment you look at it, there are no firms that move in response to the last movement of a bunch of firms, then you have no more movements. That determines the size of the avalanche. It's one, because there was a cover shock, plus the sum of all the MJs for J to AK to zero. Okay, now here's a theorem. I'm gonna give an idea how the theorem is proved. Is that if I condition on the S where the cover firm is, okay, the distribution of the, of the size of the avalanche, condition that S at this point, okay, follows what's called a generalized Poisson distribution. The distribution of the integers, which is very much studied. In fact, they are more used by sociologists and political scientists, which are interested in questions about over dispersion or under dispersion. I don't know how many of you heard about the paper who talks about how many people do you know who are in prison? That's an interesting paper by a Columbia sociologist actually. They use a lot of these distributions. That's an over dispersion. Some people know a lot of people in prison, and most of us have never met somebody who is in prison. Now, though we, we maybe we'll be aware of somebody who is in prison soon, but at this point, uh, we know, we're not that aware of that many people who are in prison. So, and I never met somebody who's actually in prison right now. So that distribution is there, that you can calculate. You can calculate its expected value, which is theta naught of S divided by the number one minus theta that I was putting, and you can, Look at its 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 variance, and its variance is the same theta naught of s divided by one minus theta q. Okay. Now the tail of this distribution, that's your starting formula, is given by an it's like a truncated power law. There's a power law l to the minus one point five, but then there is the the truncation that comes from the fact that theta is not exactly equal to one. If theta was one, there would be no trun truncation. But if theta is less than one get this, this exponential truncation. Now, if I call theta zero the average value of theta naught of s, then the unconditional distribution has the mean theta naught divided by one minus theta, and has a sigma square, which has a first term, which comes from the theta naught divided by one minus theta cube, but also has a second term that tells you about the variance of theta naught of s, okay? So that means the dispersion coefficient, because I can, ignoring the second term, I get a lower bound, of course, the dispersion coefficient of L is at least one over one minus theta squared. And that's what interests me. Now, let me give you the argument for this. I want to give you a proof. You know, it's this idea that condition M naught, the process M naught 
follows what's called a Poisson branching process, which is, I think was first studied by Galton or somebody. Um, and that's a Poisson branching process where data is the number of children per parent. Now those things are very fashionable because of the epidemiology, of course. So data is the number, is what they call, or not, whatever they call this number, the number of people that get infected from one person, for instance, nowadays. Now the distribution of our condition M not follows what's called the borrow Kennedy distribution. That's for fixed S, right? Condition M not. Now um, we have, you can prove this Poisson branching process has its distribution. Now if condition M not as opposed to to S yet. You know, M not remember is the number of firms that react to the first cover shock by changing their prices. Now M not condition S is itself a Poisson distribution with mean theta not of S and that gives you uh, that gives you A, that is this formula, this uh, generalized Poisson distribution. B, of course, is still in formula. Now C, uh, there's a whole set of probability distribution of the integers for which the probability generating function is defined via Lagrangian transformation. And this is the topic of this book by Consul and Famoy on Lagrangian probability distribution. Uh, this distribution of L is one of this Lagrangian probability distribution, more precise a generalized pro Lagrangian probability distribution, but that's not, doesn't help us a lot. So now let me talk to you about some data. Start, I'll go back to theory a little bit, but, but get to data. And I'm going to start with the Colombian, super, the Colombian billion price projects. So the Colombian billion, uh, the billion price project, as I said, is a project that's trying to get, um, a lot of high frequency data. So they look in Colombia, there's data for 992 days from a single supermarket, okay? So, and they look at all the price changes in that supermarket. Now there are 7,300 products. Uh, they, we have to use some kind of algorithm that get rid of sales because if the price goes down and then go up. Remember, we're gonna co concentrate in positive price changes because the model as written only talks about positive price changes. So we want to rule out price changes which are positive, but that result just because there was a sale. But there's an algorithm for that had been used many times by economists using this one from Cavalli 2018. There's a bunch of them. There's 992 days. In the mean day, 48 products change prices. The standard deviation is 61. So you can see the, the very 61 square. Okay, and that's some, some of the distribution. Okay, now here's the fit, just to give a little bit of a flavor of the thing. What I did is that we take a generalized Poisson, remember generalized Poisson has only two free, free parameters, only theta naught and theta free. Okay, so I'm fixing the S and I'm fixing theta naught of S and theta naught, letting theta naught and S of theta be chosen by the data, but everything else is given because I don't have two degrees of freedom. And what I plotted here, what's called a counter cumulative distribution. So it's the logarithm of one minus the cumulative distribution. It kind of looks nice. Now you can see the fit is pretty well, okay? And the data you need to fit that data is 0.87. As I said, in practice, the status are pretty close to one. And if you want to compute this measure of dispersion, sigma squared divided by mu, you get 68. So the variance is 68 times the mean. So um, now it's a problem because I'm assuming a single cover shock per day and always at the same S, but at least I have only two free parameters. The work that uh, we're doing with, with Leao and, and, and Matin is gonna do more serious uh, kind of metrics, but you can see can only fit better. It's already a pretty good fit making these assumptions. Okay. Now the two things you have to account for, uh, which are important. All this modeling is in the continuum, and what we have in the data, we observe a sequence of non-overlapping intervals, okay? But given the sequence of non-overlapping interval, we typically have two problems when you're looking at that. One is that this avalanche in one interval may not be identically distributed because the first avalanche in that interval may take a lot of people from the distribution to <laughs> And so you're going to need new guys, but that's okay, provided G prime of zero is small, which is true in our, in our simulations, 
because P star over P bar is not very large. You know, there's no, these numbers are not so far from one. Price increases in this economy, when they happen, they happen to a few percent at most, okay? Now, the other thing is that the total average in intervals may not be identically distributed for similar reasons, but this can be minimized by skipping intervals. So, one thing you can do with this data is use a combination, you use the law of iterated expectation to do some decompositions. I won't get to the details here, they're not that interesting. So, what are those decompositions? You can decompose, you have kind of two sources of shocks here. You have the Calvo shock, two sources of variation. You have the Calvo shock, and then you have the variation of the size of avalanches. You could have a lot of, a big avalanche, because you got a lot of Calvo shocks in a day. But you can also get a big avalanche because there's a, a, a long tail on the size of avalanches. And what you can do there is use the law of iterated expectations, the Poisson distribution of cover shocks, and then you can decompose it. So what you find now is that in this data, in, the, in this Columbia data, 60% of the dispersion is coming from the size of daily avalanches. It's, it's coming, dispersion of the size of daily avalanches is coming from the stochastic size of avalanches. So about 40% is coming because some days you may get more cover shock or less cover shock but 60% is coming from the dispersion in the size of avalanches. Okay, that's an interesting uh, dispersion. Now, let me talk a couple of minutes. I, I wanna talk, talk, give us maybe another five minutes or 10 to discussion. I'm gonna talk about fluctuation inflation rates. Again, you can do things with the inflation rate the same way the inflation rate is just uh, an average across N of the of the, of the changes in prices. Some prices don't change, others change, okay? Um, and one thing you, has been a big debate about economy is that when you see variations on inflation rate, is it because lots of firm increasing prices or is it because the price increases are very high? Okay. So you can do the same thing, the same decomposition, okay, between the size of the, of the uh, how much of the, of the dispersion of the inflation is coming from the fact that you're getting big avalanches and the fact that you, or the, or the fact that you're getting uh, a lot of, the size of the price changes are varying a lot. And what you find out is that uh, in Colombia, at monthly frequencies, if you look at monthly frequencies, 87% of the variance of the price level caused by price increases is attributed to variations on the size of avalanches. So the variation on the size of avalanches is empirically very important here because that's what's giving most of the variance of, of the price level. And only 30% of the variation is coming from the size of positive reprices. Now I had thought about also telling you some fit on US data. I'm gonna skip that because it's less interesting in a sense. I mean, it's nice. The only interesting fact is that this, again, for the US economy, we can get estimates of this data, and they tend to be very high already, you know, over 70% for, for inflation of the order of 3% a year. So, you know, what I want to get to from that is that, uh, first of all, we have this, this formula for the coefficient for lower bounds by the coefficient of dispersion. Uh, the coefficient that can be gotten from the continuum model. And we have theta is close to one for the data set from the billion price product, which is also true for the, for the inflation in the US. And now you can do this decomposition, this, how much, what's the importance of the variance of the size of avalanches on inflation resulting from the price increases from the data. And in general, I'm interested in the strategy of using this mean field policy functions to lower the dimensionality of problems where you have N agents and try to apply it to, to other problems.